Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Cottrell. I'm a professor of sculpture. Can you hear me? Hi. My name is Michael Cottrell, and I'm the professor of sculpture here at FSUJ. And tonight, I have the distinct honor to welcome our special guest artist, Dr. George Hart, who is an applied mathematician and sculptor who's using mathematical principles to make art and creativity cool and interesting. Um, Dr. Hart has, is a, an interdepartmental research uh, professor at Stony Brook University in New York. He has his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Doctorate in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT. He is the organizer of the annual Bridges Conference on Mathematics and Art, and he's the editor for Sculpture for the Journal of Mathematics and the Arts. He has also co-founded the Museum of Mathematics in New York City and developed its initial set of hands-on interactive exhibits. And for the past two days, today and yesterday, he's been engaging our students here on campus building really, really amazing three-dimensional structures that he's designed using these mathematical principles. And uh, you can see the one that we built earlier this afternoon displayed prominently in the lobby by the front doors and another one that we worked on this morning here by the side of the room in the back, and I encourage you to check those out uh, in addition to the uh, exhibition of digitally fabricated sculptural objects that we have in the South Gallery. Um, so no further ado, Dr. George Hart. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I have a mic. Can you hear me? Am I on? Uh, the mic's over there. I know, but I also have my own mic. So. Uh, that mic's for the camera. Oh, that mic is just for the camera. Oh, I get it. So maybe I have to stay here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I've been having a wonderful time. Uh, the past two days has just been full of exciting things and making stuff and uh, working with students and really promoting the idea of uh, combining math and art, which is really important to me. Math, science, engineering, computer science, art, uh, they all involve many of the same kinds of thinking. You have to sort of solve problems. You have to be creative. Um, the more you study math, the better you are at art. The more you study art, the better you are at math, and, and similarly with all those fields. Um, I'll mention, I, I see there's actually postcards outside. There's going to be a STEAM festival here. If you don't know what STEAM is, S-T-E-A-M is Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math at the end of February, uh, which I hope continues the same ideas that uh, I'll be giving you sort of my flavor on today. So uh, you can pick up a postcard about that. Um, what this has been running as you sat down is just a variety of different sculptures and activities and things that I've done. I'll, I'll show pictures of some of these, um, but let me see if I can switch over to a uh, PowerPoint presentation here. So I'm, this screen is only of, up there, so I, I have to kind of look around. I think I've got you. Okay, good. So. I put a title up here, the title isn't really important, but it's about laser cut plywood and cable tie sculpture, uh, just because that's what we did outside. So if you walked inside um, through that door, you probably saw a big wooden thing. Uh, that's a sculpture which we made with, I don't know, 15 or so students, maybe 20 students uh, this afternoon, made out of pieces of wood uh, that were cut. In this case, we used a router, not a laser cu uh, cutter, but you could have used a laser cutter to make it, which is what I've usually used, depending on what tools are available on campus and then holding them together with cable ties. So I'll show you a bunch of different things that illustrate how I combine math and art leading up to that uh, sculpture which is out there. Um, so as background, um, I like to make things that take a mathematical idea that I find interesting and put it in a physical form, a tangible form, so people can see it. Uh, so here's a sculpture. Um, my hope as a professor is that when people walk up to this, they begin to ask questions. They begin to think about what's going on, what's, how is that possible, what, what's, what is it? Um, can you look at it and see enough structure that you can memorize it? If you went off to a desert island, could you rebuild it out of you know, coconuts or whatever it is that you have on your desert island? Um, it has to be in your brain in a clear enough form to do that. Um, so the sorts of things you might see is that there are these bands. The bands come in five different colors. Each one crosses four other ones. It always crosses the other four colors, so it never crosses the same color. Um, there's five-way holes that have all five colors around it. Um, 
there's a lot of sort of geometric ideas that went into the construction of that, and it's sort of a puzzle. If I gave you the separate pieces, could you put them together? Um, a more abstract puzzle would be, can you make something just like that, but instead of five colors, each crossing four others, could you have six colors, each crossing five others, or four colors, each crossing three others? Um, there's sort of a, a flavor of problem that's associated with it, and that's what mathematicians spend their life doing. They think about problems that they think are kind of interesting, and they, they work on it, and maybe they solve them. And they aren't trying to solve any particular problem most of the time. They just are interested in knowing what can be done, what can't be done, and why. What are the logical connections between one thing and the next thing? And then sometimes their solutions turn out to be useful. Sometimes decades later, even hundreds, or sometimes a thousand years later, people find a way that mathematics, which was originally designed as something just interesting, turns out to have very useful applications. So what I do is I take math ideas I like, and I apply them to sculpture. I apply them to making something which is visually engaging. Um, so I'll show you a bunch of sculptures, each of which has something about it that I like, and I could probably give you a whole hour lecture on any one of these to tell you really in depth uh, what I like. But uh, here, for example, there are 72 pencils. Uh, you'll see that there's a hexagon of um, all pencils of one color, four different ones that pass through each other. So the inside of this is a hollow space. And the hollow space has the property that if you held it up in the light and let the sun shine along the direction of the pencils, you'd have a hexagon shadow. So it's a shape inside. If you lived inside there, if you were a little mouse, uh, you would have a room that has four different hexagon shadows. And thinking about that shape and what it is and why um, is an interesting question. And uh, it turns out the shape inside is what's called a rhombic dodecahedron. It's not a shape you're likely to know unless you're a mathematician or a crystallographer or engineer or, or uh, an artist, perhaps, or a puzzle designer. It's a shape that has many, many applications. Um, but if I gave you a lecture on the rhombic dodecahedron, maybe you wouldn't come. But if I make a sculpture that maybe gets you to think about the rhombic dodecahedron, that might be kind of a, a subversive way for me to, to get you thinking a little bit more logically and mathematically and, and curious about things. So that's, that's sort of my goal. Um, I won't give you the whole lecture on each of those, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, here's a sculpture made out of uh, 902 pieces of wood. It's like a mosaic. I first made a fiberglass sphere. It's about this big. And then had to locate the points where the, the pieces of wood go. There's three different colors of wood. And they're applied like a mosaic and then grouted with uh, sort of a walnut glue mixture to, to give it the dark lines in between. And again, there's a pattern there. Um, I could tell you a lot about it, but basically you can sort of follow yellow roads that go from one hexagon to another hexagon and sort of explore that space. So you could invert your mind, kind of do a gestalt shift from dark to light, and you can, you can look at the dark triangles and follow dark roads that go from one dark triangle to another dark triangle. And there's different kinds of connectivity issues. The, the, the yellow roads all make what's called a connected graph. You can get from any one to any other one, perhaps through multiple hops. But the, the dark roads make a disconnected graph. You can't get from any triangle to any other triangle you know, just following those straight dark roads and only turning at the triangles. So again, there's ideas there, a field of mathematics called graph theory. The point, the bigger point is that mathematics is full of wonderful areas, um, graph theory, group theory, um, combinatorics, there's just, just many things that are beautiful and lovely which mathematicians find beauty in. The standard you know, K-12 curriculum only has time to teach you a little bit about you know, arithmetic and algebra and trigonometry and pre-calculus. You know, there's, there's only a certain amount of time to teach you the things that uh, sort of our culture has decided are the most important parts of math to cover in school. That's less than 1% of mathematics to mathematicians. The rest of math is also beautiful and wonderful. So I'm hoping to sort of give commercials for the rest of math in my own way that doesn't make you change the channel, that gets you interested to perhaps go, maybe some of you will look at some of these things, ask questions, and say, hmm, maybe that's something I'll go look up online or read a book or uh, you know, find some way to, to learn more about math. Uh, here's a sculpture. Uh, which is made out of, uh, they look like books. This was a commission for a library in, uh, at the turn of the millennium in 99. I had the librarian set up a voting booth and all the patrons could write in their three favorite books and then they tallied up the winners and I took the 60 best ones and I made these wooden things that looked like books, used a computer controlled router to carve the titles and authors and uh, there's a steel rod through the back of each of these books, they're hollow. And then I had a foundry cast those donuts and I drilled them so that the that steel rods can go in with set screws. So it was sort of an instant sculpture kit. I brought the pieces to the library and we assembled it. Uh, there's some interesting geometry and there's a color pattern to the, the six different woods there. Um, but the idea was to get people involved in creating a sculpture uh, which was too complex for me to build myself. It could only be built if I got a community of people to help me so that it became um, sort of 
and it became owned by the community. The people who come back to that library can tell their friends, you know, I helped make that sculpture. Uh, and it sort of becomes theirs, and it, it gets them to feel some ownership in mathematics. Um, and I've since followed that model. That was the first one I did in this way with getting uh, a group. But since then, I've done many sculptures where uh, I bring the pieces to a location. And so the sculpture, which is out in the lobby, which is made of 60 pieces of wood, uh, was done similarly. I designed the pieces back in my studio in New York. Uh, they were fabricated here, and the students here put it together so that it, it's really owned by the people here. Um, these sculptures each have a different uh, story. What's, what's happening on this one is I was exploring the question of how can I design a shape that I can fit it together and not use any nuts and bolts or glue or welding, that the parts themselves lock together. So the previous sculptures I showed you, the pencil one is held together with super glue. That library book ball is made, uh, has little set screws that lock it together. Here, the pieces are all falling apart until the last one goes in, and you have to bend it a little bit, but then it kind of snaps into place, and then the whole thing springs together. It's kind of, they're mutually supporting each other. And that's an interesting challenge. How can you design something uh, that holds itself together with just one shape repeated 20 times, uh, but it locks together? Um, this is a sculpture I did uh, more than 10 years ago. I was an artist in residence at MIT, and I wanted to do something where the students would help me put this together. It's an homage to M.C. Escher. Uh, you probably know the Dutch graphic artist who did many tessellations and patterns using uh, often reptiles, amphibians, animals, and salamanders. So these are two-headed salamanders that go together. And when I built this, I didn't actually know how they go together. I sort of knew mathematically that they fit, but I didn't know what was an algorithm. So. Uh, I worked with students there, and first uh, we made paper ones, paper cut out using a laser cutter, and had the students work out a procedure that the paper can go together, and in what order, in what sequence, what parts, and then once we got that to go, then we put together the big wooden ball. Uh, this is acrylic plastic, so um, plexiglass. Uh, if you heat it up, it'll soften, so I had to design a jig, heat up each piece, put it into the jig soft and then let it cool so that it had exactly the right angle so that the parts can then uh, be glued together. Uh, this is at UC Berkeley in the computer science building. It's uh, made of CDs with slots. I cut out all the CDs and um, shipped it in a box. The box was like a one foot cube and then I went over there and assembled it. It's two meters in diameter. Question? Is that one CD or a bunch of different CDs? Um, it's 462, I think, copies of the same CD. So I got a manufacturer who had leftover CDs, like they sold all of it and they made a new version. The old one they were going to, the old version they would have thrown away and I told them that, you know, I would just cut them so they could never be read. So they all have little slots in them, they slide together. So it's sort of a custom tinker toy kit that only makes this one sculpture. So they're all the same. Um, and uh, it's actually a presentation of a polyhedron uh, the shape has triangles and kite shapes, and it's, it's a shape that I liked that hadn't been ever described in the mathematical literature. I, I could write a little paper that says, here's an interesting fact, you can make this shape. Uh, what's interesting is that the kite shape, and it's a little hard to see in the picture, but there's a kite that has three equal angles. So a kite, sort of by definition, has a mirror line and has the left angle and the right angle that are equal. But the top angle is also the same as the other two. And the fact that you can make that kite that has three angles the same and still have it fit together it's sort of surprising. It seems like too many constraints. Why should that be possible? So I, I thought that was interesting, and I wanted to present it in some way. And so I, I presented it to the world in the form of the sculpture. Um, this is a design. I might have a little model. I, uh, I don't have that one. So some of the models I ha have up here, I've made um, 3D printed versions. Um, and maybe I'll show you another one in a moment that I have a, a 3D printed version. Um, this is kind of a topological surface. It has six edges, and it's like a Mobius strip that you can walk around it and end up on the other side without going over an edge, um, made out of uh, paper mache over a steel framework, um, illustrating some ideas from topology, another branch of mathematics. Uh, this one I don't have. OK. <laughs> uh, this is made of wood, uh, again, uh, laser cutting the pieces and putting them together. Often my sculptures are a puzzle for me to solve, so I sort of know mathematically that they'll go together, but how do I actually do it physically when I have glue and do I need rubber bands or clamps or what, what's the, uh, the engineering of the process to join them together, to hold them in place, to get the glue on it? Uh, those are fun puzzles for me. I, I enjoy that challenge of seeing if I can actually make my sculpture after I think of it. Uh, this is the Stony Brook University in New York. Um, it's made out of uh, 180 pieces, 
And the challenge here is that wherever two pieces meet, they actually meet at right angles. So every pair that touches joins at 90 degrees, which seems really kind of weird. Like if I made a sculpture out of six pieces like a cube, they would always join at 90 degrees. But how can you make something more complex, more interesting, that always, whenever pieces join, they meet at 90 degrees? It's surprising. Um, you have to look at it in person, really, to understand it. Um, but it, it's a nice fact, and it's a practical fact. The reason I, I did that is because the pieces are made of laser-cut aluminum. The laser cutter cuts straight down. It can cut out any shape you want, but it cuts straight down. So if I made a little rectangular tab and stuck another piece through it, it's a tight fit if it goes straight in. If it was going to be at an angle, you have to cut a bigger rectangle to allow for the fact that the piece is coming in at a slant. So I wanted to find out what could I do that the pieces always meet at right angles. And I was sort of surprised to discover I could add more and more faces in an interesting way and always have them at 90 degrees. Have you ever failed being able to put something together that mathematically should? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, sometimes I design something and I know it goes together in principle, but I don't know quite what my process is. And I'm exploring it. And my record for the longest it's taken me to put one together is six years. So I've had something where I cut out the pieces and they were in my studio on the desk and I try different things and I was like, no, that's not going to work. And I'd go back and put it away and come back later uh, and got it back together in six years. So um, that's my record so far. <laughs> um, okay. They, uh, was that? Yeah. Okay. So the next set of pictures will involve uh, events where I make a sculpture, but I have people help me assemble it. Uh, so here's one. This is at Albion College in Michigan. Uh, they had this long uh, science center atrium that they had built, and they asked me to make something for it. Um, I made a set of nine different orbs. Uh, they start at the far end of the room, the yellow one, and they go through shades of orange up to the red one at this end of the room. They're all uh, four feet in diameter, a little over a meter. And uh, they illustrate a kind of an evolution. If you could see the far one, uh, the yellow one, far, furthest in the corner, um, it has a relatively simple structure. A mathematician would describe it as the compound of a dodecahedron and an icosahedron in dual position. Um, it's not something everyone knows, but if you look at it, it's sort of easy to understand in a sense. And uh, for me, that was like the starting point. And then as you go to the next one, the pieces bend a little bit and they change and the hole starts and then the part that was in front becomes behind. And there's sort of a step-by-step -step, uh, process. You can walk across the room uh, to come to the last one. So this was built as a barn raising. Uh, laser cut the pieces out of aluminum, uh, had them powder coated, and uh, including all the nuts and bolts and washers, there's over 18,000 pieces that had to be assembled in that day. Um, so I was running around from table to table, uh, working with these people, uh, building them all, and they're all slightly different. So I had one faculty member at each table as sort of the group leader, and I gave them general instructions, and students would come and go during the day. Uh, but I had to run around and, and uh, fix little details when things weren't quite right, but it, it all came out wonderfully. So uh, if you're up in uh, Michigan, you can check that out. Um, this is a 3D printed model, it's small, uh, in four different colors of a, a large sculpture. Uh, this one I made um, on the mall in Washington, D.C., outside the Smithsonian about three years ago, uh, sponsored by the American Mathematical Society. It's made of triangles, and uh, they go together in a very particular way. And we're starting by making these little modules, and then the modules join to make uh, larger structures and larger structures, um, until by the end of the weekend, uh, we had the complete structure. So it's uh, about 48 inches tall. Again, there's an interesting story to it, which I won't tell you, but it's a, um, it's a way to triangulate the gyroid surface that uh, no one had ever noticed before that I, I thought was really cool. And it, it's a beautiful structure, the gyroid. Um, so I wanted to do something with it and ended up with this sculpture. So what did the students learn when they actually try to put something together? I mean, it's more than a toy. Yeah, so the question is, what do students learn when they put this together? Um, they learn different things depending on their level. So they're not going to really understand the gyroid surface in the way that a mathematician might see it when they look at this. Um, but the most important thing I, I hope that students get out of this is a, uh, an emotional connection to mathematics. If people can see that math is creative and fun, they'll have a very different attitude to it towards it than many people get from the, the way our culture is currently set up. People think math is cold and was all discovered 2,000 years ago and it's, it's, it's not creative, but to people who actually take mathematics in college, uh, you realize that math is very creative, that mathematicians are always coming up with new things and they're beautiful things. It's, it's a field that's constantly growing. Um, so if I can show people 
just that there's more there than they think. They may think they hate arithmetic. That's okay. There's lots more math that you might like. Most mathematicians, professional mathematicians, hate arithmetic. Uh, but if I can get them just to open their eyes and to think and, and maybe go read a book or see a web page or a YouTube video, uh, talk to a math teacher, um, there's the potential to get them excited and to, to learn more. And then there's always particular things I might talk about, you know, 90 degree angles here and there or structures or topology or, or whatever it is that'll give them a, just a sense that math is bigger than the teacher has been telling them. And it's not the teacher's fault. The teachers are very busy teaching the parts of math that are in the <coughs> curriculum. Um, but it's, it's a problem with our culture that people don't know how much exciting uh, stuff is out there. So I'm just trying to remedy that problem in my own way. Um, did I just show that? Oh, no. So this one is at uh, Duke University in North Carolina, uh, the engineering building there. There's four orbs. Uh, it's hard to see the scale from here. The bottom one is four feet, then uh, the orange one is five feet, then uh, six feet, and the yellow one on top is seven feet in diameter. Uh, again, built as a barn raising um, over uh, maybe a half a day. And um, I might show a little video of that. Okay, so actually what I want to do is see if I can switch to video mode here. And I've got some videos. And maybe the first one I'll show you is this comet one. Um, so this is a 30 second time lapse of assembling uh, that sculpture. Just to give you a flavor of how it goes, these 18,000 pieces are being put into an organized uh, form. I had gone there a few months ahead of time and worked out exactly where I wanted to hang and put helium balloons tied to chairs in the different spots and I can measure the x and y coordinates off the walls and the height of the string so I was able to give the building people the exact x, y, z coordinates for where the chains should come down from the ceiling so the chains were already in place um, so they were able to come in after we built them all with a lift and pop them right up to the ends of those chains. We had hung a little picture of each one in place so that not only do we have it built but we had it all installed at the end of about uh, four or five hours that day. Okay, let's zip out of that. Um, okay, let me go back to the talk here. Uh, does that work? Yeah, so the next set of pictures involve 3D printing. So 3D printing is a technique in which you can think of something, describe it to a computer, and the computer has a robotic device build it for you. Um, and there's a wonderful exhibit uh, right over there, I guess, of uh, 3D printed artwork. If you haven't seen that, uh, be sure and take a look at that. It involves artists from around the country um, that use 3D printing in different ways to express their, uh, their ideas. Um, I'll show you a few pictures of things that I've made. Uh, I like taking, again, mathematical ideas. Uh, this is based on uniform tessellations in the hyperbolic plane mapped through the Poincaré disk. Um, it's a lot to talk about, but it's basically something beautiful to mathematicians that the average person has no idea that this whole alternate universe exists. And I try to take some, some aspects of it that I can communicate uh, in a form that you can see. So the complexity of this is far more than I could ever carve out of, you know, soap or whatever one carves things out of, but I can use a 3D printer uh, to make this for me. Yes, question? Yeah, uh, like what material did you use to build, build that? Because, you know, to the average eye, it may look like a sponge or a cheese. Yeah, it's hard to appreciate from a photo. It's, it's about this big. Um, it's made out of nylon, polyamide, uh, using a 3D printer by a technique called selective laser sintering. But it's basically a quarter million dollar 3D printer. It's not the kind that you buy for a thousand or so that you see in schools that are sort of hobby level. It's, it's an industrial quality machine. Um, it's one that we have at Stony Brook University where I am. And uh, it builds things of enormous complexity. Um, it's a little more expensive, uh, but for my purposes where I want to make very intricate things, it allows me to make things I could make by no other technique. Um, I have some things here in that same material. Let me see. Um, so uh, at the end of the talk, you're welcome to come up. I have a table full of 3D printed models. Uh, but this ball, it actually has 12 balls inside of each other, one inside the next, inside the next. And um, they're all different, and this is something which you could not make by any other technique. Because they're different, you couldn't like go through the holes of one to carve the next one because the pieces aren't lined up in the same spot. So I purposely designed this to sort of illustrate the idea of things you can make with a 3D printer that you couldn't make any other way. Uh, and it's quite strong. It's nylon, um, and it's the same material that's used uh, in this. Uh, 
Um, so there's a bunch here that each have a story. Those, by the way, are dyed. They come out of the machine white like that, and then I hand dye them, wet them, sort of using watercolor techniques with dyes that sort of bleed in to give them gradations of color. Uh, this is one made on a different kind of machine. This is a series of centerpieces um, about this big that actually prints in color. So I designed the color for each point in addition to the shape and send all that information to the 3D printer. Um, each of these, again, has a story about what I was trying to communicate that's mathematical. But I hope you can also just look at them as art objects and find uh, an interesting structure to them. Oh, that one, by the way, is on a postcard, and I have a stack of them. So if you want to take the postcard at the end of the talk, um, all it says is georgehart.com on the back. I could tell you that from here, um, but you're welcome to take that. Um, and again, uh, I'm so tempted to give you a little mathematical lecture for each of these, but I won't. <laughs> Uh, this one's a puzzle, so uh, this is something, uh, the files on my website, many of these structures on the 3D printer, the files are on my website, so you can download them and build your own copy of them. But here, uh, you print that bar, the bar has a couple of notches in it, and you make 30 copies of it, and then you have to put it together. So it's a challenge, can you build the structure? Oops, and my phone is ringing, sorry. Okay. Um, and um, it's, it's a interesting puzzle design to, to assemble and it's also an interesting mathematical problem. How do you get exactly the right lengths and angles and slot there so that it fits together when you're designing it? If you're, if you're going to tell the computer to make it, how, what exactly is it you tell the computer and how? Um, this is based on a four-dimensional object, so you're probably familiar with two-dimensional geometry and three-dimensional geometry. Mathematicians generalize to any number of dimensions. There are beautiful objects in four dimensions. Uh, this is based on something called a 120 cell that's been truncated. It's, it's one of my favorite four-dimensional polytopes. Um, and uh, it lives in four dimensions, so you can't really make it in three dimensions, but you can make a kind of a shadow of it. Just as a three-dimensional object can have a shadow on a, on a plane that's 2D, the same equations of perspective, but bump them up one dimension, allows you to take a four-dimensional object, shine light through it, and take its shadow into three dimensions. And uh, from the shadow, you can get a lot of insight about the object. So this is sort of a teaching model, but also a beautiful thing. So what's the fourth dimension? I mean not time, is it? Uh, no, this is a, a, so to a physicist, the fourth dimension can be time, but to a mathematician, I'm talking about a purely geometric dimension. It's, it's just an abstract notion of, imagine a set of points, instead of having XYZ coordinates, they have WXYZ coordinates. And then with those coordinates, uh, you can have a distance measure, um, like the Pythagorean theorem, and you can say, give me a set of points that are all equal distance from each other, and that defines a, a polyhedron, so to speak, in four dimensions. Um, and it turns out that there's beautiful structures, just like you know, a dodecahedron and icosahedron is beautiful in, in three dimensions. Uh, if you can visualize these four-dimensional structures, you see there's a whole other world of things, which again, does not get communicated well uh, to the public. Um, there's a great book, Flatland, which some of you may have read, which is a good introduction to four-dimensional geometry. Uh, but to mathematicians, there's, there's lots more. And just by making these, it gives me sort of an excuse, the opportunity to talk to you a little bit. Um, I have a few things here. Uh, imported from the fourth dimension. Um, uh, when you come up here, these two ones are actually almost the same object. This is uh, a model of the 120 cell. It's made of 120 dodecahedra. Uh, in the shadow, they're all different sizes, but in four dimensions, they're all the same. So the shadow does some sort of distortion. And this is a version of it that's been sort of rounded a bit to give it more of an organic flavor, but it's the same uh, structure, the same construction. Um, so because 3D printing is so powerful, because you can make anything, and because it really lets you take mathematical ideas and communicate it, uh, I've been doing a lot of workshops with teachers trying to get them uh, to use 3D printing in the classroom. So 3D printers are coming down to the $1,000 range. They're showing up. Uh, every college now has 3D printers. They're going to be in every high school and, and soon totally ubiquitous in every, uh, you know, everywhere. And they're a wonderful opportunity to get people to think about math. So for example, suppose you wanted to make a bead bead is basically a sphere with a hole through it. The sphere has an equation like x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than r squared. And to add a hole, you say that x squared plus y squared is greater than some other r squared. That you can type in the equation of a bead. And if you can type that in, you can hit basically the print button and have the bead come out on the 3D printer. 
And the cool thing is you can type in the equation for anything. Any shape at all that you want to make can be composed out of you know, spheres and cylinders and, and other uh, basics that are combined with uh, Boolean ands and or sorts of operations. Uh, so by knowing a little bit of mathematics and having a 3D printer, you have the power to create anything you can think of. And this is a wonderful way to get students to really understand the creative aspects of math that uh, by learning a little bit of math, they can create and have in their hands whatever they want. Because the actual object costs you know, 25 cents worth of plastic to build it once you have the 3D printer. Um, so here's the typical challenge I give people. Suppose you want a Venn diagram candy dish. There are no Venn diagram candy dishes for sale on Amazon. If you want one, you have to make it. But it's easy. It's a cylinder minus another cylinder and then three copies of that. The equation for this, you can write this in two lines of equations. There's a few x, y's, and z's. Uh, you have to get is it x minus a or x plus a right. It, it's sort of a challenge to, for you to, to get the math right, but then you get to have this thing that you're thinking of. Um, and it's very easy to make. So you can make your own Venn diagram candy dish or anything else. And that's the cool thing, that every student will have their own thing that really motivates them, which hopefully then gets them to study math. Let's see. While we're talking about 3D printing, maybe I'll just show you a video here of 3D printing. These names that you gave to the first section of your images, are they mathematical names? Like, uh, well, Loopy is not a mathematical Yeah, name. most of the names are sculpture names, the name of a sculpture. They're, um, they're, they're, sometimes I have a mathematical term, but most of these are not a mathematical object per se, but a sculpture that I've created. Um, I'm going to show you just the beginning of a 3D printing video. Physical models of mathematical objects can be really cool. People can hold them in their hands to study for research purposes, to pass around a classroom, or to educate the public about mathematics. They can provide geometric insight and show aspects of mathematical structure that may not be clear from diagrams and formulas. Or you may want to make some just because they're fun to play with. For example, did you know there's a way to hold this fractal structure, a Sierpinski tetrahedron, so it projects down to a square? Its fractal dimension is exactly two, and seeing how a 3D printed model exactly covers the plane gives some insight into that. So in this video, I'll survey techniques for making your own 3D printed models of mathematical structures. The technology is evolving all the time, so this isn't a how-to, and I'm skipping over details. Let's start with surfaces. Sometimes you have a parametric form for the surface bounding the object you want to make. For example, to make this solid torus, we describe the torus surface. In this 3D So that hopefully just gives you a flavor for the sorts of things you can make. These are more mathematical models, but you can make really anything that you can think of. The, the bottleneck in this process is your brain. If you could think of something cooler, you'll make something cooler. It's really, um, the machines really do not have the, uh, li geometric limitations. It's the smallest detail it can make, but it'll make any shape you can describe. Um, the next set of pictures show uh, different workshop activities, so I like to uh, design things and have, go to a place and have students sort of build them, or, or the public, anyone who wants to do a workshop. Um, so here's a fun one, to take a bagel and cut it into two pieces, cut it so the two pieces are congruent, but instead of coming apart, the way you usually cut a bagel, you get two circles that come apart, there's a way to cut it so the two pieces are linked like a chain. It's sort of an amazing fact, and it's kind of fun, and I could teach you this in two minutes. It's really not a hard thing to do uh, once you're aware of it. It's quite surprising. Um, and I might have a picture, and there it is. So it's the bagel cut, and this will be your homework. Figure out how to do that with a bagel. Do they have bagels in Florida? They must have bagels. <laughs> Probably not New York bagels, but close enough. Good enough for uh, mathematical purposes. And then if you really want to, you can calculate how much more cream cheese do you get. Because it's not a straight cut, that curving gives you a little bit extra, and there's a, a beautiful little formula for that. Um, and anyone can do it. Um, if you have a laser cutter, and they're also becoming ubiqu ubiquitous, I think in 10 years every college will have multiple laser cutters and most high schools will have them, um, you can make lots of things. So I've been designing objects that uh, you can build. This is a kit, you can cut those parts out, you can find the files online on my website, and then it builds a structure. You can make very large structures that are based on the, the space packing of octahedra and tetrahedra. It's, just, it's a beautiful little construction technique, uh, which I like, and you can learn about it by uh, making it. And again, uh, the materials are relatively low cost. Once you have the laser cutter, it's quite inexpensive to make uh, things of this sort. 
the laser cutter can draw by software? Yeah, so the laser cutter is just like a, a pen that draws, except it's drawing with a beam that cuts through whatever you have underneath it. And depending on the power level, it can cut through just paper or through wood or through thicker wood, and industrial ones can cut through metal. And is there a limitation? CNC router can't do what the laser can? Or? Um, a CNC router can do many things, but uh, the laser cutter tends to be faster, yeah. and can, it, it's much better at inside corners, and uh, the, the router has a... Um, sort of a diameter that limits the, the details. But yeah, CNC router is another technique. So it's a little trickier to do many of these things, but they can be done on the CNC router. Um, this is a construction making something called SOMA. SOMA is a puzzle. Uh, it's been around since the 1930s, but it involves cube pieces that they go together to make uh, a big cube or other shapes. And if you just scale it up by getting big cardboard boxes, which are relatively inexpensive online, uh, you can make really nice things. Uh, and it gets students kind of excited to work on things on a big scale. Uh, this is a version of my pencil sculpture, but using just rubber bands instead of glue. And uh, again, there's a, a challenge. Uh, how do you get them at the right angles and interwoven through each other? Uh, but it, it's a fun activity for students to do. Um, do they see any part of the mathematics? Those two, those two girls. At that age, I think uh, they're not seeing too much other than the fact that uh, the directions of those pencils are the four directions of the long diagonals of a cube. And that's something to think about. When people think of things going past each other, they often think of them at right angles, like X, Y, Z directions. Here, there's four different directions. If you can visualize a cube and go from one corner to the opposite corner, those four directions in space form a kind of a coordinate system which is very useful, very interesting, but you don't normally see it. So this, this pencil structure may get them to think about that in a new way. Um, this is sort of a, an exercise on what's called graph theory. It's a branch of mathematics that deals with uh, how to represent how things might be connected. Uh, basically, each of these people connects to each of the others. Uh, and there's a very nice way to do this. This is just sort of uh, surveying marking tape. Um, but there's a simple algorithm for passing the roll around and skipping and passing, skipping and passing. Uh, the fact that there's a prime number of people here, this is uh, either 11 or 13 people like this, because it's got to be a prime number for the algorithm to work in its, its simplest form. These are young, these are older young people. What mathematics do they know? Oh, these students know a lot. So this was at a math camp, uh, the, the Canada USA math camp, which takes high school students, I think 13, till they go to college. Um, and they spend a whole summer doing advanced math. So they, they were actually able to, uh, to get a lot out of this. But depending on the group, different people get different amounts of uh, appreciation. My goal is just to move everyone a little further from wherever they are. If they learn something new, I feel like the time is well spent. Uh, this is a CD construction. Uh, the CDs make a CD sculpture. Uh, they're held together with cable ties. You overlap two CDs and put a cable tie around through the holes, kind of like sewing them together. Uh, you can make uh, cool things. This is basically the structure of a soccer ball, what mathematicians call a truncated icosahedron. Uh, this is made out of light sticks, so uh, if you get enough light sticks at once, they're relatively inexpensive, held together with rubber bands, uh, making a giant structure. Maybe I'll show you a little video of that in a minute. Uh, paper. So with paper, you can make all kinds of wonderful things. I highly recommend, if you're interested in exploring, just start with paper. Make things. It's uh, inexpensive, and uh, if you don't like it, you crumble it up, you make something new. Uh, this is a, a toy called Zone Tool. I have a little model over there of a, of a shape made out of it, but you can make wonderful things out of uh, thousands or tens of thousands of pieces that are really quite beautiful. Uh, these are, again, three-dimensional shadows of objects that are from the fourth dimension um, that are quite lovely and uh, can make. This is a uh, soap bubble uh, activity. You can make a bubble in the shape of a cube. Most people don't know that. If you take a cube frame and sort of dip it in twice and play with it, you can get a cube inside a cube. So you can see in there uh, the cubes that they've learned how to make. Uh, here's a hyperboloid. Hyperboloid is a curved surface, but it's made out of straight lines. Um, I think I have time. I may show you a little video about that, um, so I won't say any more. But uh, these are made out of chopsticks or shish kebab skewers. Uh, here's some playing card constructions. Oh, I forgot to bring one of the playing card constructions that we made yesterday, but I think I have a picture of one. So uh, playing cards, very inexpensive at the dollar store. Um, just make anything in paper, but turn it to playing cards, and it's automatically cool. Um, and so I have uh, various uh, templates and videos online. Oh, this is a picture of one that we made yesterday. Um, Twelve cards that uh, it's much more challenging to put together than you realize. There's just some slots in them that lock together. 
All right, let me switch to another video just to mix things up here. Whoops. Um, watch the video and let's see if this explains what you might get out of this. Can a curved surface in three dimensions be made entirely of straight lines? Well, yes. A cylinder is a curved surface, and there's a straight line through every point. But a cylinder is straight in one direction, so it's easy to see its lines. Can a doubly curved surface, like a saddle, be made of straight lines? Surprisingly, yes. Just twist these disks to tilt the connecting strings. You find that between the two extremes of a cylinder and a double cone, there's a continuous range of surfaces like an hourglass, called hyperboloids and they're entirely made of straight lines. In fact, for any amount of turn in one direction, you could also turn the same amount in the other direction to make the same hyperboloid. This means the surface has two straight lines through every point. It's a beautiful form. Can you imagine making one large enough to walk through? I happen to have one with me, that very one. We'll warm up by using shish kebab skewers for our lines and small ponytail rubber bands to join them. It's wonderful how an initially disorganized mess begins to structure itself into such a natural form. Because the crossings are movable, the final result is dynamic. It flexes beautifully, should you want that. But let's try a different trick. You can compress it from the sides to change the circular cross section into an elliptical form. The sticks tilt, but stay straight. That's because if you stretch or compress uniformly in one direction, you map circles into ellipses, but lines remain lines. So the resulting elliptic hyperboloid is still made of straight lines, though it's more interesting visually. Our plan is to proportion it and sink it into the ground to make an arbor way for people to walk through. We'll practice with some scrap bamboo to get a sense of the engineering challenges at full scale. Flexing this model is fun, but we see we'll want to brace our structure so it doesn't flex. For the full-scale version, we first decide how many lines we want. We're placing 24 pieces of 12-foot-long bamboo in each direction, making two families of diagonals. This gets rolled up into a cylinder, taking care that one set of diagonals stays on the inside and the other set stays on the outside. Everything connects with heavy-duty rubber bands designed for outdoor use in agricultural applications. Then the structure is stretched and compressed from a circular shape into the elliptical form. Because the sticks now have different slopes, the heights of their tops now vary. So we need to saw off the ends of the longer ones to match the height of the shortest ones. Then we add a ring around each end using pliable pieces that can curve to the shape of the ellipse. This is the bracing that prevents flexing. The plan is to rotate it so it's oriented on its side and people can walk through it. Digging the trench for it to sit in is the hardest part of the job, but when it's installed, it looks great. The result is a unique garden arborway, a triumphant arch that reminds everyone of the beauty of mathematics and how certain curved surfaces are actually composed of straight lines. So that's again an opportunity to sort of informally introduce mathematical ideas while doing something fun. So it's not a lecture out of the blue, but it's something where people ask questions along the way and you can answer it right then when they're interested. Yes? Is that the same material that uh, the Chinese use for that you know, finger thing? Um, we bought the little ones out of either chopsticks or shish kebab skewers, and the big one is just bamboo that you can get at a lumber yard. Um, so it's, it's rigid material. These sticks are, are straight, they don't bend. So it's like the same material. Um, the little ones that they were wearing as hat were uh, skewers, and the big one is just a uh, rigid bamboo. It's more of the same process as what I think you're thinking of. Uh, by you trying to pull away with the thing that you're talking about, it causes the circle to become more uh, elongated, which causes your hand not to be able to pull out. Same thing, only with definitely a different material. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert in these Chinese finger locks, but I think they, they have a flexible material. It sort of spirals around. It's not, the pieces are not straight, but they do flex. So it, it has a slightly different structure, I believe. But I'd, I'd have to see one to be really sure. And then maybe 
different types of them. But that, that would be an interesting research question to, to see how they make them and how to make the optimal Chinese finger lock. Um, the next set of pictures show uh, some cardboard construction. So I often start in paper and then build in a larger scale out of cardboard and then perhaps wood and then sometimes when I can find a site with the funding to, to make something large in metal. Um, so uh, people often say, I saw this beautiful metal sculpture you made and I would love to have one at my school. And I say, yes, I'd love to make one, but it costs tens of thousands of dollars you know, to fabricate the metal, etc. And they say, oh, well, we don't have that. And they say, like, well, so what can you make for, like, you know, $50? I have $50. <laughs> and so it turns out you should not give up. Whatever your resources are, you can make cool things. So $50 gets you a stack of cardboard, and you can make wonderful things. So I have templates and uh, instructions online for various things uh, made out of cardboard. Um, this just has four slots in each rectangle and a, a, a fold, and uh, the cardboard is painted. Um, you can get white cardboard, brown cardboard, um, and uh, using a sort of a, a template, tracing out the pieces, putting them together. Uh, sometimes I use slots. More recently, I've been using glue. Uh, you can make uh, really interesting things, uh, again, quite in, uh, inexpensively, and they last a very long time. Okay? If you hang them up out of reach of anybody, they last for years. OK, so my nominal title was laser cut wood construction, so I guess I'm getting to that. Um, but it really is just all the same topic in some sense. Um, here's a large uh, pair of sculptures. These are mirror images, like left and right hand. These are uh, Alto University in uh, Helsinki. Um, and uh, they're put together by cutting out pieces of wood and then joining them with cable ties. And if you look closely at the sculpture outside, you'll see that technique. And uh, here's a pair at, uh, this is in London at Middlesex University, in a left hand and a right hand. Uh, these are kind of oblate. They're, they started out as a spherical concept, but, but shortened in one axis so that they're wider than they're tall to fit in a lower ceiling. It's a clever trick to use math. Um, so I've been sort of promoting this idea. Many places where I go have laser cutters in the school, sometimes in architecture departments, sometimes uh, engineering departments. They use them for you know, robotic projects or whatever. Um, if you have them, the people interested in art should get their whole hands on them. The people interested in math should get their hands on them because they're so powerful. They let you very inexpensively make things that are very uh, you know, intricate and very accurate. Uh, from which you can let your imagination help you, and I, I have designs to get you started. Um, so I won't say too much about that, except oh, cable ties are great because they adjust to any angle. If you have two pieces that have to come at a certain angle, you make two holes, the cable tie goes around, and it doesn't matter if it's 90 degrees or you know, tighter or looser angle, the cable tie just goes around. So you don't have to worry about beveling it as, or special brackets with you know, bent to a certain angle, uh, the kind of thing that I do when I make a metal sculpture, and there's uh, brackets that I have to prepare for the angle. Um, do you use yes. a Baltic birch or something with fewer voids in it? Uh, yeah, I tend to use Baltic birch, which is designed for laser cutting. This, the, the lumber yards nowadays stock special wood uh, where the glue is different. So outdoor glue has a, a harder glue um, that the laser cutter doesn't always go through. But if you tell them you're using laser cutting, uh, then they'll sell you, send you the right wood for that. Um, this one's at Princeton University. Uh, this one is in Australia. Um, yeah, um, that one's in Massachusetts. Uh, that's at Brown University. That's in uh, Korea. <laughs> um, that's at Google headquarters. Uh, so you packaged them up and sent them with instructions? No, I packaged them up in my carry-on luggage and went there and built them with them. So these are all ones that I built as uh, workshops. So I went there and, and uh, like we did today, uh, I, built, I worked with the students to build them. Okay, so um, I have a couple more videos, but let me give you first a couple of commercials. So one, if you like this sort of thing, uh, there's a conference on math and art called the Bridges Conference. I'm one of the organizers, and it brings together hundreds of people who love math and art. I'm, I'm focusing on sculpture, but there's people that work in every possible medium of art that you would like, taking mathematical ideas and incorporating it in their artistic creative process. Uh, so you can look that up online. Uh, this year, if you're interested, we're going to be in Finland. Um, a little bit north of Helsinki uh, in August, so you can uh, check that out. Um, and then in 2017, we'll be back in the U.S. back in North America uh, in Ontario. Um, I've been running a series of weekend events around the country called Mosaic. 
Uh, these are uh, sort of demonstrations where we bring a half dozen people there involved in math and art and different media and have some lectures and hands-on workshops. Uh, I think I have a list of the next ones. Uh, the MIT one was in December. Uh, the one in uh, Boulder is going to be uh, this month, next month, coming up soon. The web page will tell you uh, if you went to mosaicmathart.org. Uh, I have some pictures of things that we've done. Uh, this is a Sierpinski tetrahedron made out of uh, rubber bands for your hair. Uh, one of my laser cut sculptures. Um, a balloon construction. Um, this is a commercial for the Journal of Math and Art. If you're an academic and you want to find a you know, peer-reviewed publication, uh, that's the place to go. A uh, quick commercial for the Museum of Mathematics. I spent about five years of my life uh, designing this museum and the exhibits that are in it. Uh, if you're in New York City and you like math, check that out. Um, that's a typical exhibit, a square wheel tricycle. So the wheels are square, but you have a smooth ride. Why is that? There's a theorem that says whatever shape wheel you have, I can solve an equation for the shape of the floor that compensates for the bumps in your wheels. So with a square wheel, you have a series of catenary curves uh, that gives you a smooth ride. And you can ride that for adults and children. Um, and I'll last mention that I, I make uh, videos of various sorts. And uh, let me see how much time I have left. Not a lot. Maybe I'll... Um, I'm going to show you the beginning of one video, just uh, the Bridges Conference, just to give you a flavor that math and art is not just about sculpture. That's just my particular take. Um, this this will just show you at the first Every minute year, a range of other Bridges art forms. Which is about mathematics and art. In addition to talks, hands-on workshops, evening performances, and other events, the conference includes a fine art exhibition. This year's was probably the largest math art exhibition ever held anywhere. Participants come from all over the world to share their work and get a kind of creativity recharge by seeing what everyone else is making. A wide variety of media are represented, including painting, sculpture, quilts, beadwork, basketry, ceramics, computer graphics, tazib, 3D printing, laser cutting, fashion, knitting, embroidery, tamari, animation, metalwork, woodworking, wood carving, paper cutting, paper folding, paper assemblies, wire sculpture, string art, and much, much more. So this is a cheap way for making a representation of a negative curvature. You take a bath. I'll stop there, but there's much more you can see, and it's uh, just again an introduction to what, for some people, is a whole new world. Some people uh, aren't just ever exposed to this, and I think I'll end with one last video and then take questions. So what was the special aspect of that uh, seminar or forum? I mean, what was the basic idea that these people made from? Um, every artwork there has its own mathematical story. I mean, that's why people come together, they give talks, and they, they share uh, what it is that they're creating. So um, it, would, it would take hours to explain all of them. Uh, let me end with this one short 30-second video. My mind is fantasizing of a glowing light stick ball. How to make a giant orb that truly will enthrall. To make dodecahedra you need 30 sticks in all. But that is not sufficient yet to keep me in its thrall. So 20 tetrahedra in the corners I'll install. And 20 spikes surrounding like a porcupiney ball. Now here's a plan that's worthy of a glowing light stick ball. A plan that's truly worthy of a glowing light stick ball. Next, I 3D print a model, though it's very small. Symmetrical geometry to my soul does call. I want to make one large enough to fill a dancing hall. Six times 20, 20 more, plus 30 sticks I scrawl. That's 170 components all in all, plus rubber bands to bind them tight so they don't all fall. You can order sticks online or simply make a quick phone call because I don't think that you'll find these in your local shopping mall. It's such a joy to build, like the Cathedral of St. Paul, to create a vibrant light stick orb that's over eight feet tall. I do a mental tango, though my feet don't move at all. My mind is dancing happy in the glowing light stick ball. My mind is dancing happy in the glowing light stick ball.
Uh, this video is online, yes. No. So I'm happy to take questions. I mean, is it, is it commercially viable to make up kits and have schools subscribe to this sort of thing all over the country? Um, I'm not trying to sell kits. I'm trying to just give away instructions for free. So my website is just full of uh, instructions and ideas and templates and patterns and 3D printing files. Um, and I try to find support that allows me to do this uh, without having to sell anything so that I can, once I write something up, it's online free forever. Um, so uh, I haven't documented that particular construction any more than what's in that video, but if you can understand what's happening in the video, you can rubber band together uh, that structure. As I get time, uh, I'm writing up uh, instructions, and I have a series of instructions. I have a website, uh, Making Math Visible, uh, which has um, uh, you know, many sort of detailed classroom lessons for teachers to follow, and hopefully we'll continue adding more as we get time. Other questions? Yes? Two questions. Do some of these structures have fractal properties? Yes, so I, I make some things that are fractals. Uh, I showed in a video a Sierpinski tetrahedron, and uh, one of the pictures that uh, flashed by very quickly was a Sierpinski tetrahedron made out of hairbands uh, from the Mosaic Conference. Um, so I, I do sometimes use fractals. Fractals are just one idea. They've gotten a lot of press in the world of sort of math and art uh, because there's some free software and, and other kinds of ways of, of generating fractals online. Um, and I like fractals. It isn't my main thrust. I tend to be personally excited by other things, but I, I do have a few fractals online. Um, I'm trying to see if I brought anything fractal with me. I don't think so, but I, I like fractals, yes. Briefly, what is that? I'm sorry, continue? Can you comment on the state of art of uh, applying this kind of discipline in understanding bi biomolecular structures? In molecular structures? Especially biomolecular. Yeah, so I'm not an expert in biology, but um, biologists love uh, taking some of these ideas and uh, building them out, out of DNA. Uh, so uh, there's a form of artwork, and we've had talks about this at the Bridges Conference, where uh, biologists design special DNA that wraps around and it ties itself in little knots or makes little cubes or little dodecahedra um, that you can only see with an electron microscope. So it's, it's a sort of a conceptual art, uh, but it's actually a physical sculpture, but it's at a scale that's very small. Um, so that's sort of one intersection. Uh, I think most biologists are actually interested in understanding you know, how processes happen in the natural world and then being able to apply them you know, as, as possible to solve diseases or, or whatever. Um, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, I like designing things that are sort of cool to build or to think about. Um, but when biologists can, can take those ideas and, and make them physical in their own materials, uh, I get excited. I think that's really neat. <coughs> Other question here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is what kind of 3D printer and what kind of software do I use in my work? Um, so I have at home uh, an inexpensive, like a MakerBot sort of replicator uh, in the thousand to two thousand dollar range uh, 3D printer, which is the kind you see nowadays at, at many, many schools, uh, libraries are having them. Um, and uh, that's capable of making certain things. I also have a, a small stereolithography machine, um, which can make more precise models. Uh, Here are a couple of finer things that can be done on a stereolithography machine. It's, um, uh, this one is black, but you put different plastics in as a liquid, and then a light of a certain frequency catalyzes a, a polymerization reaction that hardens it up just where the light shines on it, and it builds in layers. But you can focus that light finely so it can make uh, greater, finer details. Um, I have access to other machines at Stony Brook University that work in other materials. Um, but the wonderful thing is you don't need to have a 3D printer. There are many online sources uh, where you can just search online for 3D Printing Service Bureau. Uh, there's quite a few, and they have the machine. You email them the file and credit card number, and two days later the UPS truck comes back and your thing is there. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, and that allows you to work with all these different technologies that maybe you only sometimes want to make a color one and most of the time you want to make something else. You can, you can just let them take care of uh, keeping the machine running. 
Um, as to the software question, uh, I use many, many different types of software. So uh, commercial software was designed by software engineers who were thinking about what you might want. And some are designed you know, for architects to make models of houses or for landscape architects to make models of the backyard. Uh, some are designed for engineers to make models of you know, car engines or they know about gears and nuts and bolts. Um, there's none that really knows about you know, icosahedral symmetry or central inversion in a sphere or mathematical processes that I want. So I'm somewhat unique in that my background in uh, computer science allows me to write my own tools. So I create my own software design programs that I can use that has the right buttons and sliders for the mathematical operations I want. Uh, for most things, I can uh, find an existing software that does, you know, typical operations, but then for something special, I'll export into my own software, do the thing I need, and then maybe go back to some other software that lets me you know, add a base or, or whatever it is that already exists. So I, I make my own tools, uh, which is characteristic of sort of engineering in, in the, the broad sense. What, what an engineer really is good at is thinking of something they want to make and then figuring out the tools that they have to make along the way to get to the thing they really want. And you never really see the tools most of the time, you just see the finished product. And that's similarly the case with many of my sculptures. There's all kinds of little jigs and gluing techniques and uh, software techniques that I've built along the way that allows me to get to the final object that I show you. Um, so in terms of software, it's a mixture of things. And um, my own software is just a hodgepodge of things that I, I create and constantly evolve. I, at one point, I put up a few programs online. The problem is I'm, never, I'm not designing them for the average user. So I end up getting 100 questions like, you know, how do I do this or that? And I'm just not set up to answer all those questions. So I've tended to keep my software to myself just because it saves me time. <laughs> Question here. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. But um, I think what you're saying is that the ideas here can be applied uh, in the K-12 curriculum uh, or in college or to adults. Uh, these particular topics are not strongly tied to any particular level of math, uh, and I think they can be adapted. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, my colleague Elizabeth Heathfield, and, uh, who's here with me and I, we've been writing a website that has um, lesson plans for many of these activities, and we hope to continue extending it, um, which uh, you can adapt to whatever your grade level is, whatever your uh, level of interest and, and available time is. And again, uh, makingmathvisible.com is the site for that, or you can find it by a link off of my georgehart.com website uh, if you want detailed instructions to, to try some of these things at home. Okay, perhaps I should stop there? Is that good? Or? Yeah, thank you so much, George. Okay, and I'll be happy to take individual questions afterwards. Thank you.